All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Emmanuel Boardman I'm with the LGDA, and I'm here joined today by two wonderful panelists um, from all friends who are here to speak to you about how you can accelerate drug development in CLA. And uh, with that, I'll kick it off to JP, who will do some introductions and get things started. Great. Thank you, Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, where we'll be going over community insights that we've learned from the community and within the past year. Um, but before we, be do, before we begin, I'd like to quickly introduce uh, our All Stripes team. So again, my name is JP. I'm the Senior Program Manager here at All Stripes, particularly focusing on our CLA program, I'm working in partnership with LGDA and ensuring the success of our program. And I'll pass it over to Ashley. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Leak. I am a member of the research team here at All Stripes. And the main things I'm involved in are um, doing a lot of the, the data analysis and visualization for insights for our patient advocacy organizations like LGDA. Perfect, thanks Ashley. Um, so to begin, we always like to start our presentations with our mission, which is to unlock new treatment for people affected by rare disease. And we really achieve this by creating FDA or regulatory data, data uh, that are ready for submission. Um, and we do this by partnerships with uh, advocacy groups, research, um, researchers, academics, pharma companies, but mainly, um, you know, the main force behind our mission are the patients and caregivers within the community. Sorry, so just to quickly quickly jump in, JP, do you mind uh, sharing your screen? Let's see. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Start all over again. So great. So for those of you who are new to LGDA or All Stripes, I'll just quickly go over how it works. And then Ashley will go into research insights. Um, and then I'll kind of table it off with our table uh, with our patient community and ambassador program. And then we'll go over any sort of questions the community may have at the very end. So uh, patients are and patients and caregivers are able to join our All Stripes platform by going to allstripes.com and finding your unique condition and signing up uh, on the platform. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, participants are then asked to sign an umbrella or broad general <clears throat> research consent form that gives you consent uh, to participate in minimal risk research. You'll then be asked to sign a privacy consent form. If you live in the United States, it's formally known as a HIPAA consent form, which allows us to collect medical records on your behalf. Last, patients and participants will be asked to list medical providers and facilities. Um, this will kind of tailor our, our approach to collecting your medical records. And we collect your medical records on your behalf at no cost to either the families and or the patient advocacy groups. Our team then de-identifies, anonymizes, and aggregates the data to create regulatory ready data. Um, and, and in essence, this allows for pharmaceutical companies and researchers to, uh, to submit the data that we've uh, analyzed to the FDA. Um, and I'd just like to preface here that while you are participating in research by providing your medical records, patients and caregivers own their medical uh, records and data at any given time. In other words, you can retract your participation in research at any given moment. Um, to ensure that we are collecting the entire patient journey, our team requests and refreshes medical records once a year to make sure the data and your records are up to date. So not only are patients able to participate in current and future research from home, um, patients have access to their medical records from any handheld device or any uh, computer. This allows and sort of um, eliminates the need for the infamous three ring binder that exists in, in the rare disease community. But again, our research and our data is regulatory, rate, uh, regulatory ready. In other words, again, it allows for pharmaceutical companies to really push the needle forward in drug development. And as I alluded to earlier, we get a detailed longitudinal history of, of data and medical records, which really captures the entire patient journey. So it allows for better uh, drug development and uh, clinical trial design. Um, one thing that Allstrike prides itself on is increasing research potential. In other words, we don't enter into any exclusive research partnerships, whether it be with academics and or pharmaceutical companies. And again, participants through our platform are able to participate in current and future uh, research studies and also have the ability to advocate and educate the world on their disease. 
So as I mentioned earlier, we really are proud and our mission is to drive research and provide community insights. And we often know that patients and caregivers after participating in research are often siloed and not really updated on what is being done with their data. And so one thing All Stripes prides itself on is not only providing the data back to the patient, but creating insights to create education opportunities for the community. So with that, I'll pass it over to Ashley and she'll go over our insights. Awesome. Thanks so much, JP. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for your attention today. Um, for anyone that may have joined um, while JP was going over slides, I'm Ashley Leak. I'm a member of the research team here at All Stripes. And today I'm going to present some data from our complex lymphatic anomalies or CLA cohort here at All Stripes. In this first slide, I'm just showing like a high level overview of the demographics of this cohort. So we currently have 89 participants in research, where 38% are male and 62% are female. The majority of this cohort resides in the United States, but about 27% live in either the UK or Canada. This cohort is representative of four different CLA conditions, uh, generalized lymphatic anomaly or GLA, central conducting lymphatic anomaly or CCLA, Kaposiform uh, lymphatic anomaly or KLA and Gorham Stout disease or GSD. GLA, which is shown in this graph on the right in dark blue, comprises about 46% of the cohort, while the others make up smaller percentages of the cohort, as indicated by the other colors. I want to pause here to note that only three out of the four communities in this study have reached their recruitment goal. And we're still looking for patients and families for the CCLA community in particular. Uh, next slide, please. Awesome. So on the previous slide, we saw that the majority of our CLA cohort is located within the United States. This slide just gives a little more information about where patients are located in the US. So the majority of CLA patients in our cohort live in the South, which is shown in pink, and also in the Midwest, which is just um, upwards from the Southern region. We also found that more than 80% live in large metropolitan urban areas of greater than 50,000 residents, which is shown in the right graph in pink. This data altogether is fairly consistent with the geographic distribution of the general US population, Although we do have a slightly higher proportion of patients living in the Midwest and slightly more located in urban areas compared to the general population. Next slide, please. Okay, so the rest of the data that I'm going to share in this webinar comes from a symptom survey that is located in the care journey section of our platform. And these screenshots just show kind of what that looks like when you're actually on the platform. Because um, the rest of this data requires uh, participants to fill out the survey um, and it only includes patients with a full set of records available, we're only able to share data from 20 patients across the four CLA conditions. Since this number is so low, we combined the data for all four CLAs so that we could ensure patient privacy, which is something that we're really concerned about here at All Stripes. So these data altogether should be considered preliminary um, since we have not yet reached recruitment goal for the CCLA community and because we have not yet been able to confirm all the diagnoses in the records. Just a reminder, we're still actively looking for patients and families affected by CCLA to complete our cohort. Next slide, please. So in the survey, we asked patients or caregivers three different questions. Um, the first was the year at which symptoms began. The x-axis of this graph shows years of age combined by decade of life, such that the ages zero to nine years old are shown in this first bar on the left side, and then subsequent decades to the right. The y-axis shows the number of patients who began showing symptoms in each of these age ranges. So we found that the most patients in this cohort began showing symptoms in the first decade of life, which is indicated by that first bar on the left, which is consistent with previously reported ages of symptom onset, where most showed symptoms in the first two decades of life. 
Next slide, please. So we next act. We next asked what year patients were diagnosed. The graph on the left here shows the age at which pati patients first received a diagnosis of a CLA condition. The x-axis at the bottom shows the different age groups, starting at zero and then increasing age every five years all the way to greater than 35 years old. The y-axis, like the last graph, shows how many patients fall into each one of those ca age categories. And the bar highlighted in pink demonstrates that the most patients on our platform reported that they were diagnosed with a CLA between the ages of five and nine years old. Although it's important to note that there's actually, there's a lot of variability um, in the age of diagnosis. In this graph on the right, we are actually looking at the year of diagnosis. And we found that most patients were diagnosed in the last 15 years. Um, where the most patients overall were diagnosed between 2019 and 2021, which is shown in this bar on the right side of that graph. Next slide, please. All right, so using both reported age at diagnosis, which is in the last slide, and reported age at symptom onset, which is on the slide before, we could measure how long it took for a patient to receive a CLA diagnosis after their symptoms started. So um, this graph shows experiences varied, thank you, varied widely, indicated by the hash marks at the end of this line. So patients in the cohort received a diagnosis negative one to 33 years after symptom onset. That's a really wide range. And that means some people have been living with the condition for 33 years without knowing what it was. Next slide, please. Okay, so if we look at the box, oh, sorry, can you go back? If we look at the box um, on this graph, we can see that the middle 50% of patients in the cohort were diagnosed between three months and seven and a half years after symptom onset. Next slide. The line in the middle of that box, oh, sorry, <laughs> represents the median. This is the halfway point for all of the patients. So the median time from symptom onset to diagnosis was one year, meaning that half of patients were diagnosed less than a year after symptom onset, and half of the patients were diagnosed more than one year after symptom onset. Next slide, please. So we next wanted to understand the initial presentation of CLAs. So we asked participants what was the first CLA symptom that they noticed. We found that 37% um, first noticed bone pain and or broken bones, which is shown here in the darker blue. 21% noticed breathing difficulties, which is shown in this medium blue color. And 42% experienced other first symptoms like lower back pain, chronic cough, frequent infections, and skin bumps. The most common first symptoms, which are bone pain and or broken bones, as well as breathing difficulties are consistent with the medical literature that suggests bones and lungs are most often affected by these conditions. Next slide, please. Finally, to understand the burden of these conditions, we asked survey participants which symptom most affects quality of life. 50% said bone pain and or broken bones have the greatest impact on quality of life, which is shown here in the darkest yellow. Other symptoms that impacted quality of life were breathing difficulties, chronic cough, frequent infections, and swelling and or bumps under the skin. So that's all I have to share with you all today. We hope in the near future that we'll be able to provide this information on an individual condition basis as our cohorts grow. We're so grateful to all of, all of those who have already generously provided information for this study, and we look forward to providing more insights about CLAs in the future. Thanks so much for your attention, and I'll pass it back to JP. Thanks, actually. That was very insightful.
Um, and so to continue on, I just want to touch on our patient community engagement in our ambassador program, um, which just gives a platform for families and caregivers alike. Um, and I'd like to even extend that to extended family members who, who share that uh, rare disease journey and want to you know, create education opportunities or advocacy programs or <clears throat> advocacy opportunities to share. So we have a few of our LGDA members here. We have Leah over here, who's a patient, a GLA patient, who wrote a unique blog post on her experience with uh, GLA. And then we have Michael over here on the on this purple blue box right over here. He's a patient of KLA. And his brother, even Matthew, uh, of 11 years old, wrote his story and his perspective on what it's like to, um, to, to care for someone and to have a sibling with rare with the rare disease. And I encourage everyone who who's you know part of all stripes or, or who isn't to go on our ambassador blog stories um, and read them, take the time to to read them and, un and understand more about members of your community. And if you're interested in becoming an ambassador, reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to get you set up. And with that, um, I'd like to just give us our contact support. You can always email us at support at allstripes.com. If you have any questions about joining or just joining our, um, our ambassador program or our phone number, and then I encourage you to all follow us on all of our social media in lieu of uh, you know, Rare Disease Day coming up on, <clears throat> on Monday. Um, if you'd like to participate in our Rare Snapshot or our Rare Disease um, you know, promotion, feel free to, to join so as well. And so with that, Emmanuel, I'd like to open up to the questions if the community has any. Fantastic. And thank you so much for that presentation. And looks like we already do have a few questions. Um, so first off, where can I find any research opportunities that can benefit my disease? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so again, we don't enter into any exclusive partnerships or or deals with, with researchers, and we'd like to open up all research opportunities to the community. So once you actually create a profile, there is a dashboard, or on the dashboard, there is a list of all current clinical trials that are existing for each condition, and patients can find their, their uh, research opportunities there. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next question, my family member that had the condition is no longer alive. Can I still have access to their records used to further research? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you have a family member who's passed from CLA and would like to honor them by contributing their medical research, um, by contributing their medical records to research, you're more than willing to sign them up as well. Okay, great, good information. Um, next question, so I signed my child up and they're about to turn 18. Must still have access to the records through All Stripes? Yeah, that's a great question. So once a child hits 18 and they still want to join All Stripes or be part of the research program, um, what our support team will do is kind of have the, the, the individual that's 18 years old be the primary on the account in which the individual will have to re-sign a consent form, both the HIPAA and the research consent form. And then we can add the parent as a care provider in which the parent will still have access to all the medical records. Amazing. It looks like our next question is directly for you, Dr. Leek. Um, so when you were creating your insights into the LC, into the CLA cohort, what was the one thing you found the most interesting looking at the medical records in the CLA community? Yeah, I'm always really interested to see the delay in diagnosis from symptom onset. I think it's a really important metric for how well we are treating different conditions um, and as well, like, just it, it really underscores the burden that our, our patients go through in order to get a diagnosis in the first place. The fact that we have someone that it took th them 33 years from their symptom onset to get a, di a diagnosis, I think is really sad, but also really interesting. And it really underscores the importance of investing more resources into educating providers. Definitely, I definitely agree with that. Um, and just to wrap things up, our final question. Um, how does the L, how does the LGDA benefit from me submitting records to all stripes? Yeah, so again, we we pride ourselves in providing information back to not only the families but to the patient advocacy groups, and they can further use that to sort of create education opportunities and research opportunities uh, to further develop uh, you know treatment in the moment <clears throat> and unlock new treatment for the communities. All right, great to know. All right, well, it looks like those that's the end of our questions. Um, I want to take the time to thank you again for being available today. It's a fantastic, very informative presentation. I'm sure our community will appreciate it as well. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye.